Good afternoon, ENG 1D1, Miss Boschkoff here. Today we're going to take a look at Act 3, uh, both scenes, scene 1 and 2. This is a rather long section, so we'll do our best to try and get through it. Uh, in this scene, we see that Oberon has put a spell under Titania, and she lies asleep near the, near the very spot in the forest where Bottom and his friends have come to rehearse the play. So it is very coincidental that they are coming to the exact same spot, and we often must suspend our disbelief in fiction with, um, with such coincidences, etc. They have come to rehearse the play Pyramus and Thisbe. Like most play directors, Quince has all sorts of problems to deal with. Complaints from his cast and disasters resulting from his attempts to uh, create the play's special effects. Bottom assumes an authoritative voice, explaining how the cast will uh, have to reassure their audience that the line in the play is only just pretend. Now, this emphasizes that he truly is a bit of an ass. This is a play, after all. Everyone knows the characters on the stage aren't real. Duh. Puck overhears Bottom and decides to test the cast's imagination by, playing a real, by placing a real ass head on Bottom. The rest of the players run off in fear and confusion. Titania is awakened by this noise and immediately falls in love with a startled bottom that happens to have an ass head on his, ass, on his, on his head. He is a bit of an ass. Um, what does he make of her, her infatuation with him? He can't believe that she is in love with him, but his response is that hmm, stranger things happen in love. So when Titania awakes, she is in love with an ass. Now, this whole scene is going to show Puck's mischievous side. He does not, um, oh no, he does do this on purpose this time. It's not an honest mistake. So we do see that he is mischievous. He has made some mistakes uh, before, um, that that showed that he is um, trying to be a good guy, but does make mistakes. Here, though, we see that he actually does do these things on purpose because he finds them really, really amusing. Okay, let's take a look at the sketch here. Now, this shows a forest setting, um, very useful in helping us to imagine the time and the place. Setting is always two things, time and place, and it contributes to the play because we know that in the forest it certainly can be magical and beautiful, but it certainly can be dangerous as well. And here we see that Queen Titania has fallen in love with an ass head or a person who we know to be a bit of an ass. All right, I'm going to just quickly flip back to the end of Act 2 just to quickly reiterate what uh, where we left off just to get some some context here now Hermia wakes up from a nightmare where she has dreamt that a snake ate her heart and was also smiling now we are um, we're going to see that or we do know that this is dramatic irony we are in on a secret Lysander has transformed into uh, what appears to be a kind of a snake Right? He's not really a snake, but he has been transformed into a metaphorical snake. Lysander has been transformed into a snake and has broken her heart. And what's more, he doesn't care. So in her dream, this is represented by this smiling snake. Poor Hermia is going to wake up alone and not know where Lysander went. She says, I will find you and I am actually prepared to die in the process of finding you, again, which reiterates this theme, Fool for Love. All right, let's, uh, let's get to Act 3, Scene 1. Now, in this scene, we are going to see that Bottom will have two concerns that he's going to voice to the rest of the acting troupe, and there are going to be two obstacles that are going to be uh, suggested to that they have to overcome. Now, both the concerns and these obstacles show and prove, they, they really demonstrate um, that these actors are really 
not very seasoned, that's for sure. Because firstly, um, the concerns have to do with the audience mistakenly believing that the characters are real. And again, th that's a ridiculous thing. Of course they're going to a play. They know the characters on stage aren't truly real. Okay, so the setting, we're in the wood. Titania is lying asleep. Uh, she has some love juice on her eyes. So we know when she awakens, the first thing she sees, she will fall in love with. Okay, so enter the Athenian workma uh, workmen. They will continue to make comic blunders. Um, and this, this language actually is used to indicate the lower classes. These characters are of a much lower class. All right, let's get right into this. place for our rehearsal. This green plot shall be our stage, this orphan break our tiring house, and we will do it in action as we will do it before the Duke. Peter Quince, what sayest thou, Bully Bottom? There are things in this comedy of Pyramus and Thisbe that will never please. Hey. First, Pyramus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. All right, so here is Bottom's first concern. He is very concerned that the ladies in the audience will be very, very uh, devastated by seeing a sword on stage. They know it's not real. It's a play, Bottom. How answer you that? Our Lincoln, a pile of spear. I believe we must leave the killing out when all is done. Not a wait. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue. And yet the prologue seem to say we will do no harm with our swords. And that Pyramus is not killed indeed. And for the more better assurance, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but Bottom the Weaver. This will put them out of fear. Well, we will have such a prologue, and it shall be written in eight and six. No, make it two more. Let it be written in eight and eight. Will not the ladies be afeard of the lion? Okay, so Bottom is an idiot. Everyone knows it. Um, he is suggesting that they write a prologue, something before the play, to announce that the people on stage are actually just actors. Except everybody already knows that. It's a play. The second concern here is that the ladies might be afraid of the lion. Similarly, they won't be. It's a play. But all of the actors are going to be uh, very uh, concerned about this, and they'll come up with um, a way to to um, make things better. Spirit, I promise you. Oh, but masters, you ought to consider with yourself to bring in God. She was alive among ladies is a most dreadful thing. Mm. For there is not a more fearful wild fowl than your lion living. Mm. And we ought to look to it. Therefore, another prologue must tell he is not a lion. Nay, you must name his name. And of his face must be seen through the lion's neck. And he himself must speak through, saying thus or to the same effect. Ladies, or fair ladies, I would wish you, or I would request you, or I would entreat you, not to fear, not to tremble, my life for yours. If you think I come hither as a lion, it will pity of my life. No, I am no such thing. I am a man as other men are. And there indeed, let him name his name and tell them that I is Snug the joiner. Okay, so Bottom agrees with Snug. Yes, this is a dreadful concern. And uh, he could just announce that he is an actor. Again, the people in the audience know this. They are not very seasoned actors. Well, it shall be so, but there is two hard things. That is, to bring the moonlight into a chamber, for you know Pyramus and Thisbe meet by moonlight. Doth the moon shine? That night we play our play. Okay, so Quince uh, introduces obstacle number one. He says there are two things we need, there are two obstacles, two hard things. The first thing is there's no moonlight, and then the second thing is going to be that they, how are they going to represent a wall? Calendar, a calendar! Look in the almanac! Find out, Moonshine! Find out, Moonshine! Yes, it does shine that light! Ah. Why, then? May you leave a casement to the great chamber window where we play open, 
and the moon may shine in at the casement. Aye, oh, or else one must come in with a bush of thorns and a lantern and say he comes to disfigure or to present the person of moonshine. Then there is another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber. A wall? Pyramus and Thisbe says the story did talk through the chink of a wall. You can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? All right, so Snout here says you could never bring in a wall, except for it's done all the time on stages. Uh, they are going to try to figure out a way that they can represent a wall on stage, and they're going to really think long and hard on how to do this. Some man or other must present wall, and let him have some plaster or some loam or some rough cast about him to signify wall. Ah. Let him hold his fingers thus. And through that cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. Yes, yes. If that may be, then all is well. Yeah. Come sit down every mother's son and rehearse your parts. Ah. Pyramus, you begin. When you've spoken your speech, enter into that break. And so, everyone, according to his cue. All right, so here we uh, see that Puck is entering here onto the stage. And just as a little clue, he's feeling very mischievous. All right, so he calls them blithering idiots or country bumpkins, hempen homespuns. And he's concerned that they are practicing so close to the fairy queen. He says, I'll be an auditor, which means I'm going to sit in and listen. And then he says, huh, I might be an actor too. I might have something to contribute that will, you know, create some uh, confusion. And he'll find this particularly um, enjoyable. Speak, Pyramus! Thisbe, stand forth! <clears throat> Thisbe, the flowers have odious, savor, sweet. Odious, odorous, odorous. <laughs> savor, Sweet, so at thy breath, my dearest, this be dear. But hark, avoid me. Say thou but here a while, and by and by I will to thee appear. The stranger comes to my place here. Must I speak now? Aye, marry, must you, for you must understand he goes but to see a noise that he heard and is to come again. Oh. Most radiant pyramid, most lily white of hue. Of colour like the red rose on triumphant briar, most brisky juvenile and eat most lovely dew. As true as true is horse, and yet would never tire. I'll meet thee, Pyramus, at Ninny's tomb. Ninus two man. Ah, oh, why you must not speak that yet, that you answer to Pyramus. Oh. You speak all your part at once, cues and all. Pyramus, enter. Your cue is past. It is never tired. Oh. As true as true is horse, and yet would never tire. Okay, so here, re-enter Puck, and Bottom happens to have an ass's head placed on him magically. So Puck is pranking Bottom, except for nobody is obviously aware of that. The others are going to be very, very uh, frightened, and they're going to all run off and leave poor Bottom on the stage to make even more of an ass of himself. If I were fair, this be, I will only lie. Oh, 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 Okay, so here Puck has decided to be an actor, um, a, a, an actor in, that is kind of involved in things. He's pretending to be all these things and he's leading everybody away on a wild goose chase. He's going to find this very, very, uh, very, very funny. Why did they run away? <laughs> this is a knavery of them to make me a fear. Go bottom of our chase. What do I see on me? What do you see? You see an asset of your own, do you? Okay, so this is dramatic irony, obviously. We know that uh, he he's actually, uh, his head has actually been transformed into an actual ass's head. Um, he says, what is going on here? They're trying to play a trick on me. 
it is actually a trick, but it's a trick from Puck. And he says, they're trying to make me afraid. Oh, bless me, Lord, oh, bless me. Thou art transformed. You're transformed. I see that, neighboring. This is to make an ass of me to fight me if they could. But I will not stir from this place, do what they can. I will walk up and down here. And I will see that they shall hear I am not afraid. The wounds of cock so black of you, with orange tawny bell, the cross all with it, not so true. The red wind is well. Titania awakes. Angel wakes me from my flowery bed. Whose note for many a oh. man that mark, and dare not answer, nay. Dee, you will shed his wit to so foolish a bird. Who will give a bird the lie, though he cry cuckoo never saw? I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Aye. Mine ear is much enamored of thy note. So is mine eye enthralled to thy shape. And thy fair virtue's force for both doth move me on the first view to say, to swear, I love thee. Oh. Methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. Uh, and yet, to say the truth, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. All right, so again, here we have a re reiteration of the theme, love makes you insane, reason and love keep little company nowadays. Yeah, humans are foolish when they fall in love, and she is clearly uh, very, being very, very foolish right now. The more the pity that some honest neighbors would not make them friends. <laughs> Nay, I can plead upon occasion. Thou art wise, and thou art beautiful. Ah, not so neither. But if I have wood enough to get out of this wood, I have enough to serve my own turn. Out of this wood, do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here, whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common rate. The summer still doth tend upon my face, and I do love thee. Therefore go with me. I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee, and they shall fetch thee jewels from the deep, and sing while thou on pressed flowers dost sleep. And I will purge thy mortal grossness so, that thou shalt like an airy spirit go. All right, so she says directly to him, you ain't going nowhere, buddy. I am so in love with you, um, and uh, I'm actually going to give you uh, some some fairies to attend to your every wish and desire. And in addition to that, I will try to change you to be a little bit more like a fairy, so you're not so grossly human. And I, where shall we go? Be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Oh, well, this is, he is no gentleman, he's an ass. He walks and gamble in his eyes. See him with apricots and dewberries, with purple grapes, green figs and mulberries. The honey bags steal from the humblebees, and for night papers, crop their waxen thighs and light them at the fiery glowworm's eyes. To have my love to bed and to arise, and pluck the wings from painted butterflies, to fan the moonbeams, from his sleeping eyes. Okay, so she says, uh, attend to his every wish. And then she says, I would like to have my love to bed and awaken with him. So she's feeling very in love with him, and more than that, pretty frisky too. Nod to him, and do him courtesy. Hail, mortal. Hail. I cry, your worship's mercy, aren't you? I beseech your worship's name, Cobweb. Oh, I should desire you and more acquaintance, good Master Cobweb. <laughs> if, if I cut my finger, I shall make bold with you. <laughs> your name, honest gentleman. I pray you commend me to Mistress Squash, your mother, and to Master Peascod, your father. <laughs> good Master Peascottom, I should desire of you more acquaintance too. Your name, I beseech you, sir. Good Master Mustard Seed, I know your patience well. That same card that joins thy cock's feet has devoured many a gentleman of your house. I promise you your kindred has made my eyes water out now. I desire you more acquaintance, good Master Mustard Seed. Come, 
Wait upon him. Lead him to my bower. The moon, methinks, looks with a watery eye. And when she weeps, weeps every little flower, lamenting some enforced chastity. <laughs> Tie up my love's tongue. So she says to the fairies, uh, lead him to my bower, lead him to my bed. She has some plans for the evening. Uh, she says, it looks like there might be some rain and I don't want us to get wet by the little flowers that are dropping uh, some of the rain droplets. And then she says, it's like the flowers are crying because of my chastity, because she is so chaste. She literally hasn't been um, with her husband and they're crying because she hasn't gotten anything for some time. Oh dear. Um, and then she says, tie up my love's tongue, which means shut him up already and just bring him quickly to my bed. I am so in love with him and I am very, very frisky. Okay, so next we are Act 3, Scene 2. At the start of this scene, Puck reports to Oberon that he has been successful, and he honestly believes that he has been. Titania has awakened, and, he has fallen in, and she has fallen in love with an ass. Um, and so Oberon can claim the servant boy. However, a dark comedy of errors follows. We know that uh, this is going to be called Puck's Mary mix-up. Oberon and Puck spy on Hermia and Demetrius, and Oberon realizes that Puck has given the love potion to the wrong lover. Hermia leaves to search for Lysander. Demetrius sleeps, and Oberon sends Puck to find Helena, and then he applies the potion to Demetrius's eyes. Soon Lysander and Helena arrive. Demetrius awakes and declares his own undying love for Helena. Oberon and Puck watch as Demetrius and Lysander compete for Helena's love. They're going to duke it out. Helena, though, in, interprets the behavior of Demetrius and Lysander, and even of Hermia, her very best friend, as a scheme to humiliate her, to mock her and kind of make fun. Um, as it says right here, both men now are in love with Helena, and no one is in love. None of them are in love with, uh, with Hermia. Her friend's behavior also leaves Hermia painfully confused. Before she entered the forest, she was loved by both Lysander and Demetrius, and now she is abandoned and hated by all. The four lovers argue, and Demetrius and Lysander decide to fight each other for Helena's love. Oberon scolds Puck for messing up his magical plans. He sends Puck to set things right by administering an antidote so that Lysander will awaken to his true love, Hermia while Demetrius will remain in love with Helena. So again, Demetrius will forever remain under this, this love spell. And this is important to note. Uh, we'll make a comment on this at the very end. In the meantime, what is happening to Titania and Bottom, who has been transformed into an ass? Will Oberon keep his promise? Now, this is a very humiliating situation for, for Titania. She is a queen, after all. And to have her fall in love with an ass, a donkey, and to want to bed him is very, very unfortunate and very humiliating for her. Again, um, Puck is going to find this very, very entertaining. And so will Oberon initially until he uh, starts to feel kind of sorry for her. All right, let's turn the page here and get right into scene two. It's a very long scene, so, uh, so let's get right into it. It's another part of the wood. Enter Oberon. I wonder if Titania be awake. Then what it was that next came in her eye, which she must do it on in extremity. Here comes my messenger. How now, mad spirit? What night rule now about this haunted grove? My mistress with a monster is in love. Near to her close and consecrated bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a crew of patches, food mechanicals, that work for bread upon Athenian stores, 
were met together to rehearse a play intended for great Theseus' nuptial day. The shallowest thick skin of that barren sort, whom Pyramus presented in their sport, forsook his seat and ended in a break. When I did him at this advantage take, an ass's knoll I fixed it on his head, and on his thisbe must be answered, and forth my mimic comes. Oh! When they him spy, as wild geese that the creeping fowler eye, or russet painted chops, many in sort, rising and cawing at the gun's report, suffer themselves and madly sweep the sky. So at his sight, away his fellows fly, and at our stamp, here all and all one falls. He murmured a cry, and help from Athens calls. Their sense thus weak, lost with their fears thus strong, make senseless things begin to do them wrong. Okay, so Pac is informing Oberon of what has transpired here. He is um, very, very pleased with himself. My mistress of the monster is in love. Um, he explains a group of foolish working class men were gathered. The stupidest of them, Bottom, was the person I turned into an ass. I put a donkey's head on him. And then when his friends saw him, they all ran away in fear. They were uh, running all over the place. They began bumping into each other and started bumping into other things. And again, this uh, would, would entertain Puck very, very much. From briars and thorns of their apparel snatch, some sleeves, some hats, from yield as all things catch. I led them on in this distracted fear and left sweet Pyramus translated there. When in that moment, so it came to pass, Titania waved and straightway loved an ass. Okay, so he says, I uh, chased uh, his colleagues around and around, branches clawed at them, it was very funny, and I left bottom there um, when Titania awoke in that very moment and fell in love with him. He is enjoying this moment very much. This falls out better than I could devise. But hast thou yet latched the Athenian's eyes with a love juice as I did bid thee do? I took him sleeping, that is finished too, and the Athenian woman by his side, that when he waked to four she must be eyed. Romeo, stand close. Romeo. This is the same Athenian. This is the woman, but not this the man. Uh oh, oh why rebuke you him that loves you so? Lay breath so bitter on your bitter foe. Now I but chide, but I should use thee worse. For thou, I fear, hast given me cause to curse. If thou hast slain thy sender in his sleeping, or shoes in blood, plunge in the deep and kill me too. The sun was not so true unto the day as he to me. Would he have stolen away from sleeping, Hermia? Okay, so again, here is dramatic irony. She says, uh, there was never a day ever in the in the world where he would steal away from me. Of course, we know that that is exactly what happened. We're in on a secret, and of course, this is dramatic irony. Hermia says earlier, Demetrius, if you killed Lysander, then you might as well just kill me too, because my life is over without him. Oh, believe us, soon this whole earth may be bored, and that the moon may through the center creep, and so displease her brother's noontide with the antipodes. <laughs> It cannot be, but thou hast murdered him. So should the murderer look, and dead, so grim. So should the murderer look, and so should I, pierced through the heart with your stern cruelty. Yet you, the murderer, look as bright, as clear as yonder Venus in her glimmering sphere. Okay, so Hermia says the only explanation, he would never leave my side, ever, ever, ever. The only explanation is that you murdered him, Demetrius. You better not have murdered him. And he responds, well, the opposite is actually true. Your, um, your rejection of me is murdering me. And he says, uh, you have murdered me, yet you look still so beautiful in, uh, in the light. Rather give his carcass to my hounds. Oh, dog! Oh, cur, thou drives me past the bonds of maiden's patience. Hast thou killed him then? And so be never numbered among men. Oh, what? Tell true. Tell true, even for my sake. Okay, so this is interesting here because Hermia says, out, dog, out. She calls him a dog. And he is. We, we do know him to be a bit of a dog, right? Not only that, on the next page, she says, oh, for once, tell the truth. So 
there he must have a bit of a reputation of being a bit of a jerk, right? Tell the truth for once. To so have looked upon him being awake and have not killed him sleeping. Oh, brave touch. Could not a worm and had to do so much. And had to do it for with double a tongue than thine, thou serpent, never had a stung. You spend your passion on a misprized mood. I am not guilty of my Sam's blood, nor is he dead, for all that I can tell. I pray thee, tell me then that he is well. And if I could, what should I get there for? A privilege never to see me more. Okay, so he says, if I were to tell you that he is well, what would I get out of it? So again, he's willing to lie if he gets something out of it. Again, this is a, a, a bit of a revelation about his, uh, his personality. And from thy hated presence part I so see me no more whether he be dead or no. And she's out of there. There is no following her in this fierce vein. Here, therefore, for a while I will remain. So sorrow's heaviness doth heavier grow, for death that bankrupt sleep doth sorrow owe. But now in some slight measure he will pay, if for his tender here I make some stay. He's so tired it's nap time. He lies down and sleeps. What hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken quite and laid the love juice on some true love's side. Of thy misprision must perforce ensue some true love turned, and not a false turn true. Okay, so out of your mistake it follows that you've messed up big time. You've messed up true love and not even fixed the false one. You've really made a mess of things. Fate or rules, that one man holding troth, a million fail, confounding oath on oath. About the wood, go swifter than the wind, and Helena of Athens look thou find. All fancy sick she is, and pale of cheer, with sighs of love that costs the fresh blood dear. By some illusion, see thou bring her here. I'll charm his eyes against she do appear. I go, I go, look how I go. Put the an arrow from the garden's bow. So get Helena here right now. He's going to fix it. So he's going to get Demetrius to beg Helena for forgiveness. Re-enter Puck. He is going to announce that Helena is close by. Captain of our fairy man, Helena is here at hand, and the youth mistook by me, pleading for a lover's fee. Shall we there fond pageant see? Lord, what fools these mortals be? Okay, so this line by Puck is going to be a very important line for you to remember. Lord, what fools these mortals be. Again, it reiterates the theme, fool for love. Stand aside, the noise they make will call oh, no. the to awake. Who will do it one who won? That must needs be sport alone. And those things do best be me that before preposterously. He thinks that would be hilarious if that did happen. never come in tears. Look, when I vow, I weep, and vow so born in their nativity all truth appears. How can these things in me seem scorn to you, bearing the badge of faith to prove them true? You do advance your cunning more and more. When truth kills truth, oh devilish holy fray, these vows are Hermia's. Will you give her all? Weigh oath with oath, and you will nothing weigh. Your vows to her and me put in two scales will even weigh, and both as light as tails. I Okay, so he says, I love you honestly. I am true to my words. And she says, oh, 
Give me a break. Your lies are getting very good, Lysander. Why are you saying the things to me that you should be saying to Hermia? I had no judgment when to her I swore. Well, none in my mind now you give her all. Demetrius loves her and he loves not you. Oh, Mary. Huh? God is in Okay, so Demetrius wakes up now and is in love with Helena. So, uh, to make even more confusion, we now see that both men are in love with Helena and no one is in love with Hermia. To what, my love, shall I compare thine eye? Crystal is muddy. Oh, how ripe and show thy lips those kissing cherries tempting grow. That pure congealed white, high, tall snow, fanned with the eastern wind, turns to a crow when thou holdst up thy hand. Oh, let me kiss this princess of pure white, this sea. Oh, spite! Oh, hell! I see you all are bent to set against me for your merriment. If you were sick of a new courtesy, you would not do me thus much injury. Can you not hate me as I know you do, but you must join in souls to mock me too? If you were men, as men you are in show, you would not use a gentle lady so to bow and swear and superpraise my parts, but I am sure you hate me with your hearts. You both are rivals and love Hermia, and now both rivals to mock Helena. A trim exploit, a manly enterprise, to conjure tears up in a poor maid's eyes with your derision. None of noble sort would so offend a virgin and extort a poor soul's patience, all to make you sport. Okay, she is convinced that they are in a grand uh, scheme to mock her and make fun of her and play a big joke on her. Um, and then she says, if you were really, truly honorable men, you wouldn't make fun of a true lady this way. You are unkind, Demetrius, be not so, for you love Hermia, this you know I know. And here, with all goodwill, with all my heart, in Hermia's love, I yield you up my part. And yours of Helena to me bequeath, whom I do love and will do till my death. Never did mockers waste more idle breath. Lysandra, keep thy Hermia, I will not. If e'er I loved her, all that love is gone, my heart to her, but as guestwise sojourned. And now to Helen is it home returned, there to remain. Helen, it is not so. Disparage not the faith thou dost not know, lest to thy peril thou are by it dear. Lysandra! Look where thy love comes. Yonder is thy dear. Dark night, but from the eye his function takes, the air more quick of apprehension makes, wherein it does impair the seeing thing. It pays the hearing double recompense. Thou art not by mine eye, Lysander found. Mine ear, I thank it, brought me to thy sound. Why unkindly didst thou leave me so? Okay, so poor Hermia cannot figure out why Lysander has left her. It's so unlike him. And she says, the night has blinded you both. And she says, and me too, because I couldn't, I couldn't find Lysander anywhere, but I did hear him. And I, I followed the sound of his voice and thankfully I have found him, but why would you ever leave me? So again, the fact that she's saying night has blinded them is uh, a reiteration of the theme that love is blind. Why should he stay whom love doth press to go? What love could press Lysander from my side? Lysander's love that would not let him bide. Fair Helena, who more engills the night than all your fiery o's and eyes of light. Why seekst thou me? Could not this make thee know the hate I bear thee make me leave thee so? You speak not as you think. It cannot be. No. She is one of this confederacy. All right, so poor Hermia here. She has no idea what's going on. Lysander hates her, and she can't figure it out. In fact, he says that he loves Helena because she shines brighter than all the stars. Helena is going to think that Hermia is in on this conspiracy to make a big joke of her. She can't figure out why her best friend would betray her in this way. Now I perceive they have conjoined all three to fashion this false sport in spite of me. Injurious Hermia, most ungrateful maid, have you conspired? Have you with these contrived to bait me with this foul derision? Is all the counsel that we two have shared, the sisters' vows, the hours that we have spent when we have chid the hasty footed time for parting us? Oh, is all for God? All school days friendship, childhood innocence? We, Hermia, 
like two artificial gods have with our needles created both one flower, both on one sampler, sitting on one cushion, both the warbling of one song, both in one key, as if our hands, our sides, voices and minds had been incorporate. So we grew together like to a double cherry, seeming parted but yet in union in partition, two lovely berries molded on one stem, so with two seeming bodies but one heart. Okay, so she she's trying to figure this all out. Have you betrayed me, my best friend, uh, Hermia? I cannot believe it. We were so close. We are um, like soulmate friends. In fact, she says we were like two peas in a pod. We did everything together. And now you have stabbed me in the back? Two of the first, like coats in heraldry, do you butt to one and crown it with one crest. And will you rend our ancient love asunder to join with men in scorning your poor friend? It is not friendly. It is not mainly. Our sex, as well as I may chide you for it, though I alone do feel the injury. I am so, so hurt by this. I am amazed at your passionate words. I scorn you not. It seems that you scorn me. Okay, so poor Hermia is like, WTF is going on. You not set Lysander as in scorn to follow me and praise my eyes and face and made your other love, Demetrius, who even but now did spurn me with his foot to call me goddess, nymph, divine and rare, precious, celestial. Wherefore speaks he this to her he hates? And wherefore doth Lysander deny your love so rich within his soul and tender me, forsooth, affection, but by your setting on, by your consent? What though I be not so in grace as you, so hung upon with love, so fortunate, but miserable most to love unloved. This you should pity rather than despise. I understand not what you mean by this. And she really doesn't. She has no idea what's going on. So poor Helena says, are you responsible for this big joke on me? The only reason Lysander would ever betray you is if you had asked him to. Um, as a cons as a conspiracy, they like to play a joke on me. You should feel sorry for me and not hate me. I do. Prosever, counterfeit sad looks, make mouths upon me when I turn my back, wink at each other, hold the sweet jest up. This sport well carried shall be chronicled. If you have any pity, grace, or manners, you would not make me such an argument. But fare you well. It is partly my own fault which death or absence soon shall remedy. Okay, so she says, I can't even believe that you are such a backstabber. You talking behind my back and winking at each other and making jokes behind me. She says, this is such a good joke. This is such a good little prank that it deserves to go down in history as written down in history. Hey, gentle Helena, hear my excuse. My love, my life, my soul, fair Helena. Oh, excellent. Sweet, do not scorn her so. If she cannot entreat, I can compel. Thou canst compel no more than she entreats. Thy threats have no more strength than her weak prayers. Oh. Helen, I love thee by my life, I do. I swear by that which I will lose for thee to prove him false as I love thee not. Okay, so again, reiterating the theme, fool for love. I say I love thee more than he can do. If thou say so, withdraw and prove it too. Will you come? Lysander, where to tend all this? Are we you, if you... Okay, so Lysander says, um, if you think you love her more, let's duel this out. Let's, let's fight this out as men. Draw your sword. Let's go at it. And Demetrius says, oh yeah, yeah, I can do this. Oh no, he'll seem to break loose, take on as he would follow, but yet come not. You are a tame man, go. Cannot thou catch thou bird, vile thing, let loose, shall I will shake thee from me like a serpent. What? Okay, so again, here's Hermia saying, what is going on? And he basically tells her, hang off, which essentially means, um, F you. Thou cat, thou bird, thou vile thing. He tells her, get away from me, just hang off. Now you've grown so rude. What changes this sweet love? My love. Out, tawny tartar. Out. Out, loathed medicine. Hinted potion. Help. Do you not jest? Yes, sooth, and so do you. Demetrius, I'll keep my word with thee. I would I had your bond, for I perceive a weak bond holds you. Oh. I'll not trust your word. What, shall I hurt her, strike her, kill her dead? Although I hate her, I'll not harm her so. What can you do me greater harm than hate? Hate me well for. Oh, me, what news, my love? And not I, Hermia, or not you, Lysandra? I am as fair now as I was there a while. Since night you loved me. Yet since night you left me. Why then you left me? Oh, the gods forbid. In earnest, shall I say? I, by my life, 
and never did desire to see thee more. Therefore be out of hope, of question, of doubt, be certain, nothing truer. Tis no jest, but I do hate thee and love Helena. Oh, me, you juggler, you canker blossom, you thief of love. What, have you come by night and stolen my love's heart from him? All right, so poor Hermia's trying to figure this out. Hermia has actually lost her bearings. A little bit earlier on here, at line 273, she says, am I not Hermia? Are you not Lysander? She is so confused. Everyone is behaving in a completely opposite manner from what you would expect. She goes on to say, I, I can't believe this. You two-timing worm. You were double-timing me behind my back. You are an untrue friend. Fine, Evaith. Have you no modesty, no maiden shame, no touch of bashfulness? What? Will you tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue? Fie, fie, you counterfeit. You puppet you. Okay, so this line, you counterfeit your puppet, is an important line because it gets miscommunicated, it gets misunderstood by uh, Hermia. She says, you counterfeit, you untrue friend. And then she says, you puppet. But she means that she's just, you know, somebody's little puppet. She doesn't mean it to be uh, a comment on her short height, but Hermia is going to misunderstand this and is going to think that she is putting her down and calling her a midget. Puppet? Why so? Aye, that way goes the game. Now I perceive that she hath made compare between our statures. She hath urged her height, and with her personage, her tall personage, her height forsooth, she hath prevailed with him. And are you grown so high in his esteem because I am so dwarfish and so low? How low am I, thou painted maypole? Ooh. Speak, how low am I? I am not yet so low but that my nails can reach unto thine eyes. Okay, cat fight here. She says, um, you are, this is how this game is going to go now? The way, that, that way goes the game? This is how the game is going to be played now? And she says, okay, so you're going to call me a midget, but I'm going to call you um, a painted maypole. And she says, even though you're a lot taller than I am, don't you worry. I can reach up high enough to put my nails into your eyes. So they're going to, they're going to duke it out themselves. Though you mock me, gentlemen, let her not hurt me. I was never cursed. I have no gift at all in foolishness. I am a right face for my kind. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. You perhaps may think that I see something lower than myself, but I can match her. You are hot again. Oh, Hermia, do not be so bitter with me. I ever wanted love you, Hermia. Did ever keep your counsel? Never wronged you. Say that in love under Demetrius, I told him of your self under his wood. He followed you. For love, I followed him. But he has chipped me ahead and threatened me to strike me, burn me, made to kill me too. And now, so you will let me quiet go. To Athens will I bear my folly, but I can follow you no further. Let me go. You see how sinful and how fond I am. Why get you gone? Who is that hinders you? A foolish heart that I leave here behind. What? All right. Whoops. So, um... So Helena is really, she's a little bit scared of Hermia. This is her best friend. She knows that even though her best friend is shorter than she is, she is a much better fighter. And she says to the gentleman, don't let her hurt me. She is shorter, but she's a really good fighter. And she says again to Hermia, I can't believe that you've betrayed me this way. I kept all your secrets and this is what you do to me. And she says, I'm just going to head back to Athens like a fool. And again, here we see the theme, fool for love. But with Lysander, Demetrius! Be not afraid, she shall not harm me, Helena. No, sir, she shall not. No, you take her part. Oh, when she's angry, she's keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when she went to school. And though she be but little, she is little yeah. again. Nothing but low and little. Why would you suffer her to blast me thus? Let me come to her! Get you gone! Oh. Minimus, the hindering not grass maid, you bead, you acorn. You are too officious in her behalf that scorns your services. Let her alone. Speak not of Helena, take not her part, for if thou dost intend never so little show of love to her, thou shalt abide. Now she holds me not. Now follow, if thou darest, to try whose right or thine or mine is most in Helena. Follow. Nay, I'll go with thee. All right, so Lysander says um, to Helena, get out of here already, you little dwarf. So again, she's going to take this uh, very sensitively, thinking that they're calling her... Um, 
something derogatory, a midget. And so, um, not that it's derogatory to be a midget, but she is afraid that they are meaning it to be derogatory. Demetrius here says, stop acting like you have any chance with Helena. She, and then he says, um, I call you out. I call you out to fight over Helena, if you dare. And then Lysander says, oh yeah, I dare, let's go. And Demetrius says, okay, follow me. And uh, if you are man enough, follow me over here and we'll duel this out. Exit Lysander and Demetrius. Okay, so here's where I do need to turn, uh, turn the tape over. Um, as it rewinds, we'll just go through a little bit of what's going to happen here. So Helena says, uh, you may be a better fighter, but I can still run faster than you. She says, I'm not going to stay any longer in your cursed company. Line 341. Your hands um, are quicker to fight. Like you're, you have a quick punch to you. But she says, my legs are a heck of a lot longer than yours and I can run a lot faster than you. So she says, I'm out of here. Leaving Hermia alone on the stage to just be completely confused. I am amazed and know not what to say. So essentially she's saying, I am so flippin' confused. She also will exit at that point. Next up on the stage, we're going to see Oberon and Puck. Oberon is not going to be very pleased with Puck. And he's going to say, Puck, did you do this on purpose to be a little, um, like a little shit disturber? And uh, I guess a, a little crap disturber, I should say. So, um, but we know Puck already. He is a little bit of a crap disturber, isn't he? So uh, Puck is going to say, believe me, no, this was a mistake. I didn't mean to mix things up so badly. I didn't do this on purpose. But he's going to say, I certainly am enjoying this though. Oberon then is going to come up with a plan to try and fix Puck's merry mix-up. Perhaps you are no longer staying in your cursed company. Your hands and mine are quicker for a brain. My legs are longer, though, to run away. I am amazed. I know not what to say. Poor Hermia. Poor Helena, too. This is thy negligence. Still thou mistakes or else commits thy neighbor is willfully. Believe me, King of Shadows, I mistook. Did not you tell me I should know the man by the Athenian garments he had on? And so far, blameless proves my enterprise, that I have anointed an Athenian size. And so far am I glad it so did sort, as this their jangling I esteem a sport. Thou seest these lovers seek a place to fight. Hi, therefore, Robin, overcast the night. The starry welkin cover thou anon with drooping fog as black as Asheron. And lead these testy rivals so astray as one come not within another's way. Like to Lysander sometime frame thy tongue, then stir Demetrius up with bitter wrong, and sometime rail thou like Demetrius. And from each other look thou lead them thus, till o'er their brows death counterfeiting sleep with leaden legs and batty wings doth creep. Then crush this herb into Lysander's eye, whose liquor hath this virtuous property, to take from thence all error with his might, and make his eyeballs roll with wonted sight. When they next wake, all this derision shall seem a dream and fruitless vision, and back to Athens shall the lovers wend with league, whose date till death shall never end. Whilst I in this affair do thee employ, I'll to my queen, and beg her Indian boy, and then I will her charmed eye release from monster's view, and all things shall be peace. Okay, so here's Oberon's plan. He's got a plan to fix this merry mix-up. So he says, all right, so you know these men are wanting to go off and fight. He says, Robin, overcast the night. So 
darken the night with fog and make yourself imitate each of these men and lead them around and around until you tire them out, you tucker them out, and they cannot fight. Just lead them around and around so that they both um, are so tired they have to fall asleep. And then he says, at that point, put the love juice into Lysander's eyes to fix this mess. He says, I want this mess all fixed up so that when next they wake, all this derision shall, she, sorry, shall seem a dream and fruitless vision. That's line 370. So again, this is an important line because it um, makes it seem as if everything that had happened was all a dream. And this again is a reiteration of the title, A Midsummer Night's Dream. So then Oberon says, while you're off fixing that mess, I'll go and see my queen. I'll beg her to give me the Indian boy and then I'll release her from her charm and everything will be perfect. Let's see if it is. My fairy lord, this must be done with haste for night swift dragons cut the clouds full fast and yonder shines Aurora's harbinger at whose approach ghosts wandering here and there troop home to churchyards damned spirits all that in crossways and floods have burial already to their wormy beds are gone for fear lest they should look their shames upon they will flee themselves exiled from light and must for aye consort with black browed night but we are spirits of another sort i with the morning's love have oft made sport and like a forester the groves may tread even till the eastern gate all fiery red opening on neptune with fair blessed beams turns into yellow gold his salt green streams. But notwithstanding, haste, make no delay. We may affect this business yet ere day. Okay, so Puck says, oh, look, the, uh, the dawn is approaching, morning is approaching, let's hurry up. It was uh, a myth that fairies could not um, be out in the daylight. And so Oberon is going to explain, well, that is a bit of a myth. I am a fairy of another sort. I can actually enjoy being out in the morning. But he says, Puck, you do have a good, uh, you have a good point though. Let's still hurry this up to wrap this up so that it doesn't go on, drag it out for another day. Let's, let's do that. Let's hurry things up. Okay, so we see that Puck was leading them both astray, tuckering them out essentially, right? So Puck is actually enjoying this very, very much, uh, leading them both astray. Eventually, Lysander gets so tuckered out that he says, I'm so sleepy and tired, but I can't wait till the morning to get my revenge on Demetrius. Hmm. 
pipe hand, are you? I buy me about dead. For well I want now runs before me, shifting every place, and dares not stand nor look me in the face. Well art thou now? Nay, then thou must be. Thou shalt buy this dear if ever I thy face by daylight see. Now go thy way. Faintness constraineth me to measure at my length on this cold bed. All right, so he lies down and falls asleep as well. So essentially he says, uh, I'm so sleepy I need to rest right here. But, oh, Lysander, he better watch out in the morning. He threatens him. Uh, next we see Helena comes back onto the stage. Okay, so Helena says, this is a long and weary, sad night. She says, I am really looking forward to the morning when I can make it back to Athens and get away from these people who clearly hate me, making fun of me behind my back. She says, I'm just going to go back to Athens. But she says, oh, I'm, I'm so sleepy right now. Uh, I hope things are better in the morning. I'll just lie down here and sleep. Yeah, but three. Come on, more. Two of both kinds makes up four. Here she comes, cursed and sad. Cupid is a knavish lad, thus to make poor females mad. Okay, so here we see that, we see clearly the theme that uh, when you're in love, you're a little bit crazy, right? So Cupid uh, makes females go crazy in love. Now, here we see that he is mischievous, but he's not mean-hearted. He truly does feel sorry for Hermia here. Never so weary. Never so in woe, dabbled with the dew and torn with briars. I can no further crawl, no further go. My legs can keep no pace with my desires. Here will I rest me till the break of day. Oh, heavens, shield Lysander, if they mean afraid. Okay, so she truly loves him. She says, I'm going to have to rest right here, um, but if, uh, if, if Lysander is around, please make sure that, that he is protected. So now all four of them are asleep. The four lovers are all asleep. On the ground, sleep sound. I'll apply to your eye, gentle lover. Remedy. When thou wakest, thou takes true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eye. And the country proverb known that every man should take his own in your waking shall be shown. The jack shall have Jill, naught shall go ill. The man shall have his mare again, and all shall be well. All right, so there we have the end of Act 3, Scene 2. Now, in Puck's final um, soliloquy here on, uh, on stage, he expresses what is going to happen. He kind of foreshadows what's going to happen here. So he squeezes the juice on Lysander's eyes, and he says, when you wake up, you are going to be in love with the woman you were in love with before. Um, thy former lady's eye, and he's uh, again foreshadowing that all will be well. Jack shall have Jill, so you know, um, a man will have his his partner, and nothing will go wrong. Now, again, it's important that he foreshadows um, that this will all turn out uh, good because this is a comedy. For Shakespeare, 
a comedy usually ended up with great happiness at the end and very often a, a marriage celebration. So when Puck says, all shall be well, he really is foreshadowing that things are put back into their proper place. All right, peace out.